At the Newstead Historical Society meeting, November 8, 1979, a panel discussed our ethnic heritage. The panel members were the Reverend Thurber Thayer, who is the first speaker on our English ancestry, Mrs. Hannah Bitterman for the Irish, Neil Shabaki, Italian, and John Kegabine, German. Gladys Brown is the moderator. The panel was asked to tell when and why their ancestors came to this area, then to name some of the contributions each group has made. The first three named were classmates in the school, which was situated where the Newstead Town Hall now stands. The first speaker is Reverend Thayer. So that after the war, they came here and settled uh, following the Revolutionary War. It was 1800 about that settlements began in western New York. So I think it was uh, mainly for farms that they came originally back in the early 1800s. Of course, later industries brought people there. That's just sufficient for that. Thank you. Uh, Hannah? The Irish came here mostly for work. They were looking for a place to work. To uh, They needed a job. And they came, most of them came directly from Ireland. Um, I know my own grandparents came directly to New York and came from New York to Batavia. They not only them, but uh, their bro the brother, my grandmother's brother, two brothers came to this area. They, uh, there were some farmers. The girls that came, a number of them came, were mostly houseworkers, workers in the house and housemaids. And the boys worked in the tunnels and on the railroad when it was being built through here. I'm talking about now about my own family background. And most of the others follow the same way. I think that's about well, it. Hannah, maybe some of them don't know what you mean by the tunnel. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know where the falls are in, well, I guess I'll have to say East Akron, but I always have called it Falford, on Murder Creek. And under this, there was tunnels going, dug, so the tunnels dug underneath, and they mined limestone from those tunnels. Of course, there were also limestone tunnels west of the village, known as the Cummings Works. This work that I'm talking about in East Akron was the Newman Works. And they, uh, it was a long time, they marked, marked limestone, mined limestone there until around, oh, it must have been 1910, 1911, when they finally closed. And it was a case of Mr. Newman just losing what he had. I wouldn't say he went bankrupt, but he lost his property. And we, uh, what happened? And they came here, as I say, during the time of the Civil War, looking for work. And uh, some of them were uh, signed into the army by somebody that had money enough to pay them. I think it was $300. They took their $300 and they went to Canada. That is what we call the skedaddlers. Now, you know what that means. <laughs> I won't swear that my people were, my ancestors were in it, and I won't swear they weren't. <laughs> But uh, that is where we get the name Skedaddler from. I think it is a Gaelic term. I'm not sure about that. So that's about all I know about the origin of their coming here. The railroad, of course, that they worked on was the old thing that is here no more. Thank you. Mr. Shabaki. <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm going to start off with a Mrs. Brown tonight had added about 15, 20 years on to me, but uh, <laughs> she started off, she said that uh, she likes to get these older, these 80, 90 years old people around. <laughs> 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 no, no. <laughs> I think I should. Well, I don't, I don't resent it, but I hope I get there. <laughs> I, I, you know how people misread what you say. Uh, I ask if I might take them, if they objected to being taped, I said I have an oral history uh, program going where I like to tape 
of the people in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I wasn't here in the 80s or 90s, either one. I came in this century. <laughs> well, going to the question, the Italians, were, the first Italian was Rosie Ellis, if some of you older people remember. He was the one here. But my, my folks came here from the mines of Pennsylvania. They were coal miners. And the reason that they came here was that uh, there were gypsum mines developed. If you go back your history, your gyp gypsum mines was developed at that time. And uh, there was a mining engineer by the name of Stuart Sill, who was in Scranton, Pennsylvania. That's where I was born. And uh, he came up here to explore the gypsum thing, and it was quite lucrative because uh, to make plaster and things. And uh, so he got some of the miners, he got my my dad and, and a few other ones to come up and work in the mines. And there was, a, at that time, there was two mines, one where the National Jip is now, it's a gold bond, and the other one was the Akron, up here with the certainty that the Georgia Pacific is. And uh, Mr. Ralph owned that mine at that time, and there was an accident, they were trying to develop the mine, and the, man went down there and he drowned it in the water. So they were experienced miners and that's why they got the coal miners, my folks, and them to come up as experienced miners. And uh, <coughs> there was th three families, the Caceres, the Caporales, and the Cabaches that came up. And I know that <coughs> where we first lived was this side of the Blue Inn. There was a farming house there. And I can still remember my, <coughs> my mother, she, she came from the mining town of Scranton, which was there, and we out in the wilderness. It was the only farm land, uh, farmhouse there. And uh, then they had her scared that there were Indians there. She didn't get out of the house for weeks because she was so scared. And uh, from, <coughs> from there, they developed the mines, and uh, that's how they originally are Italian. But uh, there was Italians up at the quarry. That's the cement works up in Akron Quarry. There was a, they were there ahead of us. There was the Deguano, the Capus, and the Carlos. And Rosie Ellis was the other Italian that was one of the first that was here. And uh, from the mines, we went up and we accomplished a few things if you want to go up later. <laughs> John? <clears throat> My ancestors didn't come to this part of the country. Three of them, at least, uh, were my, my grandfather and grandmother were born in Mecklenburg, Germany. Came to the Akron area about 1870. My grandfather, Tesno, was born in East Oakfield. Uh, one thing happened when, uh, uh, let's see now, my grandmother, Tesno, was a Kratz, and when her father and mother, she was 10 years old, came, uh, they shipped him to Akron, Ohio by mistake, and uh, they were good-hearted back in them days, so my Aunt Esther Wren tells me, and uh, they, the railroad, because they made the mistake, sent them back to Akron, New York, where they belonged, and they first lived, uh, well, a few people here will remember what we used to call the cider mill on East Avenue, the Free Methodist Parsonage is there now, and there's another house behind it where Bob Plain lives, and that was part of the cement works, and there was a row of houses there, and that's where Henry Cross first lived. My mother was born on Valley Farm, where my great-grandfather lived, is the farm where Don Bruning lives now, down on the Tesno Road. And my grandfather, Kegelein, left Germany because of the feudal system. And I think a lot of the people that came out of Germany at that time left because of the oppression and the conditions there, where it was almost like slave labor. My grandmother happened to have, well, two of her brothers were in the Buffalo area before they came here. He came to Buffalo, and I can remember an incident uh, in the family history when Delaware Park Lake was dug. It was in the Depression of 73 or 77, whatever, and they worked for a dollar a day, 12 hours a day, digging that lake. And he, what is now Northampton Street, he helped build that street in the city of Buffalo. He worked for the Dole Packing Company, which is now non-existent. It became high-grade when Jake Dole had four people working for him and they 
killed and did everything by hand, and he peddled his meat by hand with a hand wagon. He later built the show place down on the Niagara River called Dole Farms down in Wheatfield, uh, Wheatfield, Wheatfield, town of Wheatfield, between North Tonawanda and Niagara Falls, and that's all gone to rack and ruin. But mainly the, far the people around here, uh, the German people, were in the farming business. My grandfather Tesno's wife was a Foss. They came from the Lindenville, Medina area. Any of you know Al Foss in the bank today? He goes back about a 13th cousin or something. Go from there later on. There, we know we have. The whole east side was the German section. My grandparents lived on Herman Street and on Fox Street. Well, all of Buffalo was divided in its colony, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but now we have integration. We, have <laughs> <laughs> uh, we know there are many other <clears throat> national groups who have come to Newstead, uh, particularly Polish and Yugoslavian, and lesser numbers, of course, of many others. I was not able to get a a speaker on uh, the Polish. I thought I had someone, and um, then there was a conflict of dates. But I did talk to some, and particularly to Michael Zola, and he said that in uh, around 1910 and 11, <clears throat> there was conscription in Poland. And many young men, just under 18, came to this country at that time to avoid military service. And they came, of course, also to better themselves. And most of them worked first, perhaps, on the railroad and later in a factory in order to get money to buy a farm. You know, many of them wanted to be farmers. We have many Polish farmers, I believe, today in our, in our area. And this is what many of them wanted to do. They really didn't like the city, but they were forced to live there sometimes in order to have work. And I talked to... Uh, <coughs> to Catherine Swain, Catherine Rebovich Swain. Uh, you, most of you probably know the Rebovich family. Her father came here when he was 17, his wife was 18. And in, later, his wife died, <coughs> leaving three children. Uh, he wrote back to his, to his relatives in Yugoslavia, and this was the Croatia part of Yugoslavia, saying he needed a wife. So they picked out a girl for him and sent her over, and that was Catherine's mother, the second wife. They had um, eight more children, so there were 11 in all. They lived, they lived on Cummings Road when I knew them, but when they first came, they lived in so-called company houses associated with the Cummings Cement Works. Now, if you know where Leisurewood is today, there were two homes in the woods on the upper level that belonged to the two Cummings brothers who owned the cement works. And there were a lot of company houses down at the level of that stone crusher, which you can still see parts of it standing back in the field when you've got Cummings Roads off to the right, uh, below where the viaduct used to be. You know what I'm talking about? The houses were between the peanut railroad track and the ledge. Yes, there down a, at that There was a level. store there that was run by Nick Burr, and there was 12 houses. Mm -hmm. And I know that Henry Hart grew up there, and so did Wesley Scott. A lot of you know those two people. I mean, they have died, but uh, one time uh, Henry took uh, Kelsey and me and I think somebody else all through that area and explained where everything was. We found the cellars of the old homes and, and explained where the houses had been and what went on there. So we have other uh, Yugoslavians in town. She mentioned uh, uh, Kapans. Um, well, it's of course, there were Skosiks. They were related to Rebovitches and lived in Cummings Road. And the Kosses, you know. Austrians. Uh, well, Yugoslavia. Austrian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They are. The bands are Austrian. Right. They are. <laughs> well, now Katie seemed to. Well, okay, that's, all, that's what she told me. So we'll. <laughs> and can, and can that's what the panel's for the descent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Right. Koss was a Yugoslavian. Yes. I Mr. Koss was Austrian. Her papers every year for the mm -hmm. post office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And when, the, when the Catherine Rivovich's father came here, Catherine Swain's father came here, he'd had no schooling, couldn't write his own name. Uh, his wife had had, or that Catherine's mother had had uh, three years, third, we'd gone through third grade. And so it was a big event when his children <clears throat> were able to teach him to write his own name. And later he became naturalized, and they helped him learn the Pledge of Allegiance. And she said it was the proudest day of his life when he got his naturalization papers and became a citizen. So I thought that was rather interesting. She told me a lot more. She had she was in Yugoslavia uh, about a year ago and uh, was able to find some of her relatives there. She had very exciting. Well, now we're interested in what contributions uh, these various uh, groups have made and any interesting anecdotes you know about them as a group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, contributions that they made. We have some very good ones and some that aren't so good, as all the others do. Uh, they were good workers, very good workers. The Irish, they were witty and they were daring, which might be a little surprise, but they were. Now, the contributions that they did, I remember when, as a child, I met Mr. Charles Heist, if any of you know who he is. He was a um, super district superintendent of schools. And he was telling me that when he was young, they used to have institutes, which was nothing more or less than teachers' meetings. And he wanted to like to go to the teachers' meetings, not for information that he got, but to see the marvel of northeastern Erie County two red-headed Irish school teachers. <laughs> One of those school teachers was a lady known as Hannah Mahoney, and the other was my mother's sister, Nellie Tinney. And they were the marvels, two red-headed Irish school teachers. Now, they are not the only Irish school teachers. That other one, was, another one was Nell Hurley, and there was also a young um, Emma Park and Emma Parks. Somehow Emma never, people didn't consider Emma Irish, but she was Irish. <laughs> and she was an excellent teacher. I went to school to her and she could pound something into my head. She was good. Uh, the Hurleyhees, one of the boys, a John Hurleyhe, turned out to be a doctor, and he was also very good. And the daughter, or the son, of one of the other boys, one of the Hurley boys, was here, maybe many of you might remember him, Dr. Darden. He was second generation Irish. Dr. John Hurley, or he was third generation Irish. Dr. John Hurley was second. No, Dr. John was first. I was right the first time. And uh, then uh, I have purposely left out one to put in as the last. And he is famous throughout the United States and his family. I am referring to none other than Brigadier General Dennis Edward Nolan, who was head of Pers General Pershing's intellectual staff. You don't hear a great deal about him because he led the spy system, and he certainly did one crackerjack of a job. Uh, he was, uh, he had two brothers, both of whom were in the army. One died, got as far as base hospital in France and died a flu. He was very good. You remember Irma Eckerson? Irma was his girlfriend. And she, he was her only boyfriend. Marty Nolan died. That was the end of her romance. And uh, they tell some funny stories about some of those. Many of you know Betty Jumper. She was second generation <coughs> Irish. And her mother and Mrs. Nolan, Dennis Nolan's mother, were, or her grandmother, <coughs> and Mrs. Nolan's, Dennis Nolan's mother were sisters. So Betty is some cousin of Dennis. I'm not going to try to tell you what he is, but she was. <laughs> But uh, if I did, I'd tell it wrong. Thurber could correct me. <laughs> uh, they tell us stories about some of these 
people. And uh, one of them was Sailor Brown. Have you heard of Sailor Brown? So far as I know, he never was on a ship and never was on the ocean. His sailing experience, if you know where the Fireside Inn is now, back of that there used to be a mill race, a, creek, a branch of the creek that was dug out, and then water went down under the road and through a, well, I don't know what you call it, something about that square, maybe a little more so, and out right by the falls to run a mill wheel, which they had at the time. Well, for some reason or other, this sailor, who was real name was Mark, he fell in. And he went down this mill race. And he was, until the day he died, he was the sailor known. <laughs> when I heard of him, I thought, gee, he must have been the first Irishman to be belong to the Navy. He never belonged to the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is a story they tell about General Nolan. He was a young man. And in those days, Practically everyone in what was then known as Falkirk, and to me it still is Falkirk, they told uh, that Mrs. Nolan was sick. She was the only one in the family that could milk the family cow, and they needed the milk. So Dennis was rather resourceful, put on his mother's dress, his mother's sunbonnet, and she always hummed an Irish tune. I never knew what the tune was. If I did, I couldn't hum it for you anyway. And he walked out with the milk pail swinging, much like his mother, um, went out, and by golly, he milked the cow. <laughs> Just as long as Mrs. Nolan was sick, he milked the cow. Which we always, I always got a big kick out of hearing about that. Um, contributions, they, uh, of course, the very fact that Denny Nolan was a great man in the army, and he not only was Pershing's head of staff, but he took part in many conferences after the war. I tried to get a hold of him, but as usual, when I need the car, the car is like a kid at seven. I didn't get the car. And, uh, but they, uh, of course, I am very proud of the fact I myself am second generation Irish. And by the way, we hear about the Kennedys, second generation Irish. They did this and they did that. They are. Nice family on that side. <laughs> but remember, Dennis Nolan was first generation Irish. And I don't think a Kennedy alive ever did any more than he did. They may have been president, but they never did any more than he did. Had he gotten to be president, had he taken the right type of education, he would have probably been president himself. Now, I have on the table here a picture, which you are free to look at, taken October 18, 1911. And the boy standing in the back in a sailor suit was Dennis Edward Nolan, Jr. We never could understand why they put a sailor suit on the son of a soldier. And the nephew was another. We never got that straight, but he, they did. And on the place, Thurber Thayer is on there. Dr. Dargan is on there. My brother is there. Two cousins of John two were there. Two uncles and an aunt. What's that? Two uncles and an aunt. Yes, uh, yes they were your uncles. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> and an aunt of his is there. Also, Mary Holt. If you know Jimmy Holt, Mary it was his mother. Mary Coffin, she was at that time. And Ellen Karen, who later became Mrs. Sweeney, Ellen Sweeney, and Loretta McNiff is the tall girl standing there. Now, if you can pick them out, and I am, of course, I am there. I wouldn't have the picture if I wasn't. But it isn't mine anyway, it's Thurber's. And then here is another picture which Thurber brought to me, gave me, loaned me, in which the three Nolan boys are. And if I'm not mistaken, one of, or I know one of the boys on the haystack is Joe Darden, who later became doctor. And the other one is Dennis Edward Nolan, Jr. Now, what became of Dennis? He died in less than two months after this picture was taken. He died of pneumonia. He had a baby sister who lived, grew up, and got married. I don't know what her name is now. But uh, she was a very, people that knew her were very proud of her and spoke very highly of her. 
And on this picture also are the three grown gnomes that are all gone now. I think everybody on the picture is gone. And most, the surprise, most of these people are gone. But uh, I don't know, is there anything else you wanted to ask me about? Of course, one of the characteristics of the Irish, they sure knew how to swallow. I'm not trying to be funny, and I hope I'm not insulting any Irish. <laughs> uh, speaking of family history, my grandmother was from the county Cork. My grandfather, of all places, from the county Tyrone, in the province of Ulster, from the village of Armagh. And if you know anything about Ulster, and Tyrone, you know what's going on up there? The very same thing that went on a hundred years ago when my grandfather was there. There was constant fighting between the Presbyterian. Now, I'm not throwing any signs at Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Because I have a great deal of respect for all religions. But it happened that those North of Ireland people that were not Catholic, most of them were Presbyterian. And my grandfather got out of Ireland. He always told us dressed in his sister's clothes because Queen didn't want him to leave. She didn't. She wanted to send him to Australia. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Mary's laws can look about for all of this, can't you, Mary? Because <laughs> her father was my brother. And on the other side, I don't know why I was part Irish back somewhere. But I find that the, the Irish contributed many things, particularly what's now the Fireside Hotel, Fireside Inn. That, I understand, was built by an Irish, somebody that was Irish. I know it had a history, some of it, that I don't like. <laughs> and I understand, too, it was the Catholic, that, or the Irish that built the Catholic Church. I may be a little wrong on that, but I have always heard it was. So if we did give you a hotel, we ought to be the church. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe there was a Presbyterian church in Ireland in at right. which a number of Irish went. Emma Parks went there at one time, and when she died, Emma was a very good freelancer. But her family were Presbyterian. I didn't <laughs> Uh, Hannah, was, would the Irish have built up Falker? Did they come in and build homes there? Did they really settle the place? No, I don't think they did. No. They came in and lived there. There were Irish living there. Now, uh, Mary Holtz's, Mary Kaufman's grandparents lived there. And what's now the wider place across the old Tina, where the old Tina used to be. She lived, they lived there. And uh, my grandfather's two brothers boarded with my grandmother's two brothers. I don't know whether my grandfather ever did or not. Then my grandparents also lived at the West Crusher, or not the West Crusher, yes, it was the West Crusher, but it wasn't the Crusher then, it was the Cummings Mine, and the Cummings Tunnel. And now there's a difference between a Cummings Tunnel and a mine. The Cummings is very close to the surface of the earth, the mine is very deep, and the tunnels are so close. In fact, you can still see the remains of the entrance of the old tunnel in Falkirk, which the state forced them to close, because some kid somewhere got in a tunnel, in a cave, and got and died. And when that happened, of course, you know, the state steps in pretty hard when these things happen. All right, close all the tunnels. And Schuler Boy was the one that went out and closed, it, when they closed these tunnels, and he took a cousin of mine, or an uncle of mine, Daniel Tenney, with him to find the tunnels, all the tunnels. Well, Uncle Dan knew them all. That's Leo Tenney's father I'm talking about. So I was a descendant of Tenney, too. <laughs> but it was definitely an Irish settlement it at one definitely time. Right? There a were lot some... of Irish people there. They sort of clustered in Falkirk, pretty well, much. Well, there were some Scotch here. There were a few German. A couple of German families. But in general, I mean, many of the Irish who came lived there at that end of the Now the Karenses, the um, Eddie, Edie, this is Edie. I, Mr. Eddie, I understand, was English. Old Mr. Eddie. 
And of course, there was the counters that run the hotel, horrors of horrors. And they, uh, the Montgomery's were English. I'm wondering, do you all know what she means by fall her? And the Browns. Anybody who doesn't know? I wondered about that. Falkirk, it is up in the area around the Fireside Inn. You know where that is? You know where the Mini Mart is? He's the Mini Mart. The Mini Mart, in fact, Swanson is Island. where there was one time an old firehouse. We had three fire companies, mostly Irish up in that end. And believe me, they could celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> they. Uh, okay, cool. It was really. Uh, Cement City was. And the parking lot that they have for the Mini Mart and the garage was at one time a grist mill. Of course, that's getting away from the Irish, but the Irish worked there. And the Irish worked in the chips and the cement mills, which was right there, too. The Newman Cement. Well, thank you very much, Anne. What's that? May have, thank you. We may have some more some questions for you. Uh, I hope not Neil, too many. <laughs> would you <laughs> like to? There's the bride. Have you know what I said? I've got to tell this story about Ann. I went to school with her brother George. Oh, good heavens! And we were, <laughs> and we were in a chapel. There were there was three grades in this chapel, and uh, our teacher asked some of the students what they'd like to be, and if they want to be. His, lawyers, doctors, or anything, and George got up and says, no, he says, I want to be a ditch digger up in the tunnels. And Hannah was in the two grades ahead of her. She got up, and you ought to have heard her spout at her brother right in the chapel. We three were in the chapel all at once. <laughs> Do you remember that, too? I don't remember that, but I was probably there. Because... <laughs> I don't know if he was, too. Well, they had, a, they had two teachers, Mr. Madison, and two teachers to calm you down, anyway. <laughs> you know how. <laughs> no, where, where am I? Boy, the achievements of the Italian? Well, I can't beat the Irish. They... <laughs> <laughs> you can equal us. You can't beat us, no. You can't equal us, either. You got any notes. Naturally, you went into religion and politics. I'm going to stay out of there. Religion, I guess that we found that I think the Irish founded the Catholic Church, and I also think they were instrumental in finding, founding the uh, Presbyterian. Mr. John Hart, who is historian of the town of Newstead and the village of Akron, is being interviewed by Zeke Corey on radio station WXRL in Lancaster. November 25th, 1979. In January, John and Mrs. Hart will be moving to Arizona, so he has tendered his resignation as historian, effective December 31st. One of John's many interests is genealogy, which he hopes to pursue more actively now that he has retired from the New York Telephone Company. John is also past president of the Newstead Historical Society, which is the subject of this interview. So we are trying to be an active organization, and we're getting more and more active all the time. How long have you been in the organization, John? About nine years, ten years. And uh, actually, what what is the primary objective of the Historical Society, briefly? It's, uh, the primary objective is to stimulate uh, the historical events and collect archives and uh, material which represent the history of the town of Newstead and the village of Akron and all the other little towns that made it up at one time, which some of them no longer exist. Mm -hmm. uh, when we speak of collecting the history uh, of the township, we're talking about current things because everything that happens today is history tomorrow and so we're not only looking for the old things but we're looking for things that are happening, things that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and John, you have a hundred and so many members, right? Yes. Sir. Uh, are all these members active? No, uh, there are dues, they are dues paying members and uh, uh, probably about uh, a third of those that show up at meetings, give or take a uh, few, but a lot of them uh, 
I'm just supporting the historical. I'm supporting the historical society, and they travel, and some of them are always home and so forth. And I understand you're looking for new members. We're always looking for new members. <laughs> uh, this is in the Akron Newstead area, right? Yes, sir. Uh, our rates are cheap. Uh, individual adult uh, is only two dollars a year, and uh, that gets him about uh, ten very enjoyable meetings free with uh, free refreshments, and uh, we're always happy to have. Uh, families, uh, couples are three dollars, and then we have rates for children also. Uh, John, how do you go about uh, joining? I mean, what do you have to do? Who do you have to call? Well, um, if you showed up in the basement of the Denial Library about eight o'clock on the second Thursday uh, of the month when we have a meeting, not not uh, let's see now last. Thursday was Thanksgiving. Did you have a meeting last Thursday? No, that, no, would, that would be the third. That would be the third Thursday. So in other words, uh, it would be the second week into December. December, yeah. I believe the date is, uh, let be specific, uh, the date would be the 13th of December. In other words, you are going to have a meeting yes. on the 13th of yes. December. And that's our year-end Christmas meeting, but it is a meeting and, and everybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. And if you came to that and uh, liked what you saw, we'd be glad to sign you up right then and there. Mm -hmm. Or you can contact Ellsworth Brown, who's the president, uh, myself, uh, Kelsey Webster, uh, Gene Palmer, all these people are officers that are readily available within the town, which would be more than happy to sign you up. Mm -hmm. And I also understand that uh, you're looking for a bigger a uh, place to hold your meetings and a bigger place to display all your uh, historical, uh, act, you know, that you have acquired, right? Yes, uh, we have acquired considerable artifacts and uh, papers and books over the years. Uh, right now they're scattered around in many, many locations simply because we do not have a storage and display facility. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, excuse me for interrupting, is there one thing that uh, kind of sticks out in your mind that you have collected is really uh, something different or something uh, well, historical? Well, we have uh, quite a collection of old carpenter tools, which is probably one of the biggest of our collections. And uh, we have uh, all some old clothes and things of that nature, which uh, we have used in various shows. And yeah, you've had like some that. displayed around the Akron yes. area, different yeah. stores, I know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fine. And uh, I see here, I have a little pamphlet in front of me here, a little, uh, that you have quite a program for 1980. Yeah, we have, uh, through the efforts of our program chairman, Mrs. Jean Palmer, and uh, uh, the executive board, uh, we have come up with a program again this year, which looks very good. And then starting up in January, where we're going to talk about uh, old Newstead photos with some... Uh, Slides and other exhibits put on by uh, James Stapleton. Going into February, we're talking about historic buttons, and uh, we have a button collection there, and, and that will be uh, exhibited. And if you, anybody in any of these programs who comes and has something which they would like to show or have somebody to talk about or maybe identify, uh, they're always welcome to bring in their own particular things like. Okay, this is Lancaster Speaks, and this is Armand Corey. And uh, this morning we're talking to Mr. John Hart, and he's from the Akron Newstead Historical Society. And John, sorry to interrupt you, but I know you said now in January you have the old photos. Right. And in February you had the buttons, right? Right. And how about March? Well, we're going into, we're looking at herbs and medicinal plants. Akron, we're going to, I mean, uh, in April we're going to visit the Clarence Historical Society and their museum. In May, we're going to look at wool and the wool merchant and how they use it in garments and with, with some displays and films. In June, we're going to tour some of the old landmarks and old homesteads and newstead. We will have an antique exhibit and craft show on the 4th of July weekend in the Newstead Town Hall. Mm -hmm. And then we have our annual picnic and auction in August. We plan a dinner in September to kick off the fall program. Next October, we're going to be looking at the old schools and the school 
histories from the township, and then something kind of tied around Veterans Day of November of 1980, where we talk about Akron and its participation in various wars. And there we are again in December of 1980 with an annual Christmas party. Mm -hmm. so we've made the circuit there for the upcoming year. And these programs are very informal, and uh, you're always welcome, as I said earlier, to come and participate and ask questions. And if you care to join, we'd be happy to have you. If you didn't want to, I just feel welcome anyway. Now, we were talking before about if any of our listeners in the Akron Newstead area have any, uh, should we say, antique or historical uh, items. Uh, can they bring them up and leave them there uh, for your... Yes. How, uh, how does that work? Do they leave them there with you, or do they well, donate them? They uh, leave them with me. Um, as a town historian, I receive some things which ultimately wind up with Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Uh, the president, Ellsworth Brown, or any of the officers, uh, uh, we give out to the person a receipt, which indicates that, one, we receive something, uh, whether as a, as a loan or a gift, and the people get a copy of this, and that puts it on record, and if there's any tax value, it also gives them something that they can use for tax credit. Purposes. It becomes a property of the historical. And then, depending on whether it's a loan or a gift, yes. it would be so treated in the, in the realm of history. That was a person who couldn't even have the loan time they, they until yes. they want it back. Yes. And and that, that happens in some cases, uh, and probably other societies more than it does ours, because the other societies have a meeting place and somebody will loan a picture or loan uh, an item to display for a while. And well, what type of a meeting place are you looking for, John? Well, we were looking, we, we hoped at one Hall time type? to get a, have the Octagon House, of course, but mm -hmm. that's still, um, That's a historical landmark yeah, itself. That is a historical landmark. It goes way back into the middle 1800s. And it is, of course, privately owned and is, hasn't been uh, committed to us as yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Would you open it up to the public if, if it was? Yes. Eventually, it would be. That's uh, just about <clears throat> one of a kind, isn't it? There's not two. Well, it's uh, the only one in Erie County, and I, I have a book at home which was printed about 30 years ago, which there were only 19 in New York State at that time, and I'm sure I know that some of those have been uh, oh, yeah. removed. And, and uh, Have some, you ever been in there? In the our yes. Oxygen House? Yes. Oh, yes. We are trying to get it uh, recognized as a national landmark at the moment, and uh, I have spent some time in there with drawing floor plans and things like that to mm -hmm. fill in the application. I see. But that would be one source. Uh, uh, some building which was easily accessible and with good parking facilities, uh, if possible, would be the ideal situation. In other words, what would you do? You would have like a display room, meeting room? You yes. would display your items uh, permanently, you know? Yeah. They would be oh, yeah, we, the public to see yeah. every day. Yeah. And we have uh, things could be displayed outside as well as inside. Mm -hmm. We have old sleighs around in people's barns and things like that, which uh, we... In other words, right now you've, them all, you've kind of scattered all over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because we don't have any centralized place even to store them, much less display them. So. Mm -hmm. That's uh, our prime objective, is to get a place to call home. Uh, do you, how do you raise money for all these projects, John? Well, we raise money by having auctions, uh, and that's probably the biggest thing we've done, well, maybe not the biggest. We are also selling uh, uh, some items which uh, we've been selling tiles, uh, African house tiles and stationery for several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are available through uh, myself or through the Webster family, uh, Dorothy or Kelsey Webster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a plate which represents the entire town of Newstead. It has pictures of Everything that's of historical interest in the town of Newstead, uh, mm -hmm. such as the mines and the Octagon House and the, uh, the Indian Reservation, uh, those are available both at the Village Hall, the Town Hall, and through the members of the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. um, there must be quite a bit, uh, quite a few historical things down at the reservation, shouldn't there? Have you collected any of those yet? No, we haven't got into those 
too much. Those are pretty much in the jurisdiction of the Indians, and mm -hmm. uh, although I know they do participate in our meetings periodically, and they will bring things down to show, and I feel pretty strongly that yeah, they'll they be taking care of their own things. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, tell us a little bit about the benefit of the uh, society, the New Stead Historical Society, and not only in Akron, but in any village, town, or whatever it be. What are some of the advantages? Uh, what does it do for the public? What? Well, it ties the past and the present and the future together. It's basically what a historical society is designed to do. Uh, if you are to keep any kind of a record, uh, either in the form of a paperwork or, or material things, somewhere there has to be a collecting point. Mm -hmm. uh, between the a historical society and a historian, and they're generally two different items. One mm -hmm. is interested in artifacts, and the historian is probably interested in the record side of it. Uh, this is a centralized point which permits the history of the community to be recorded and ultimately made available for school children. Uh, anybody who has an interest, uh, we get involved in working with the Boy Scouts on various merit badges. We get involved with helping the school children on projects, Yorker projects, uh, historical projects. Uh, I even had people who write in the newspaper come out and want to know something about uh, a segment of the community, which and they came out to see what we had in the historical society's files on it. And it's a collecting point. And if you lose it, you lose it, because uh, uh, so much of the stuff that can't be replaced. And uh, when people were more permanently located. And by that, what I mean, people's families stayed in an area for generations. Yes. The artifacts and the information stayed in an area for generations. Mm -hmm. But with the Mobile Society, which we are part of today, uh, people move. And, and you might lose it. You lose it. Or the, the, the youngsters have moved and they come back home and help clean up Rapa's estate and they say, well, this throw is this rubbish. Way. Let's yeah. throw it out. So we are anxious to collect that. Let us throw it out if it's not usable. But. Mm -hmm. This is Armin Corey. This is Lancaster Speaks. Today we're talking to Mr. John Hart, Jr. And uh, he is from the Newstead Historical Society in Akron, Newstead area. Uh, we're just talking about let us throw things or let us decide what are... A lot of people do not realize, uh, probably, not the value of an item, right? It doesn't have to be... Uh, Money-wise, either does it? That's, that's correct. Sometimes the historical, again, we're back to the historical value uh, of an item, which might be a lot to you, but not much to some other people. So, actually, uh, you would advise people before throwing something in that area over away, they should call the historical society. Yes, and we'll we'll have somebody pick it up if possible, even if it's old newspapers or old letters or anything or something large. Of course, would be fine, but. Uh, We've been fortunate that in certain periods of time, people have saved things over the years, and then there are gaps where we uh, have been that fortunate. Our pitch at the moment is to try to keep this flow of material coming, because in the future it will be history. Mm -hmm. Old newspapers is quite... Uh, you're looking for those, right? Yes. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, collection. collection of newspapers from the early 1800s to 1900, mm -hmm. and from 1927 to now. But in that gap from 1900 to 1927, the, our oh. forefathers weren't as conscientious, and, and we just don't have them. Well, was there a newspaper oh, yeah. in the news the Akron, And Akron News or Akron Breeze was going in there very strongly. And, and then nobody seems to nobody have Nobody saved them as a... As a depository like we have in the rest of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now we're looking for new members. New members. We're looking for a permanent home. And we're looking for any kind of artifacts, memorabilia, which represents the Newstead Akron area. Mm -hmm. Do you ever uh, 
Do you ever combine forces with other historical societies? Well, we meet together periodically. We've met and gone over to uh, Alden. And but each one has their own uh, collection? Well, oh, yes, yes, they have. yes, they have their own collection. And uh, you will find that they get pretty well uh, provincially stay with their own area because mm -hmm. if they don't, they start getting so much they can't handle it. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you still, like you say, there's a lot of things that you are looking Any particular items that you are looking for that uh, some of our listeners might have around the Akronusid area? Is there anything particular? Well, I've already mentioned newspapers. Right, yeah, we did. We right. talked but about I, that. Anything and, uh, else? Uh, any old family Bibles that we're happy to have those. Uh, any stories or, or articles about the former residents of the town, or the present ones for that matter. Um, do you, uh, do you get anything. into the family tree? Uh... Well, I get it from the historian point of view. I get into that a lot, yes. I'm constantly answering letters from people who write to us from around the country about, uh, tell me something about Aunt so, Grace who, yeah. who lived here or lived there in such and such a period of time because I have a letter that somebody wrote to her there and I have been building up a family history record and kind of a family tree. Yeah, and I'm doing that on all the names and places I can get in the Newstead area. Now, uh, of course, you were talking about the newspaper before between 19 and 1927. Now that you're looking for too, aren't you? Yes. That would be what, the Akron Breeze? It's the Akron Breeze and Somewhere along the line there, it changed the Akron Herald. I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm, yes. when, but in that well, time. Well, it was the Akron News, too. Wasn't it? Yes, at one time, yeah. And then the Akron Herald. It's been a name or two. In fact, at one time, there, was around the turn of the century, there was two newspapers in town. But one of them didn't last very long. The name escapes me at the moment, but mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing that. And books you're also collecting? Uh, books, particularly if they con are concerning the Newstead area. Uh, we're not looking for old history books per no, se, just no. to, but books or documents or yeah, the diaries. Yeah, concern the Akron News today, yes, that's what you're yeah, mainly... Diaries, things uh, of that nature. Uh -huh, how, and photos, you have... Oh, we, we can always welcome photos. We have some, uh, we're starting to log them in and get them categorized so uh -huh. they'll be indexed. Um, Always interested in photos, old mm -hmm. costumes, uh, clothing. Clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, you say costume. You mean you're talking the older dresses, maybe in the nineteen, early nineteen hundred. Yes, or uniforms of yeah. people that uh, you know they might have worn in the service, or uh, firemen's uniforms, or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Maybe not called costumes, but that's the type of thing you look for. Mm -hmm. Well, John, we've got a few more minutes left here. I think uh, what we should do is maybe. Uh, review these programs once more for our listeners, and maybe if they'd like to get a pencil and paper and jot down any particular one that they would like to attend, it would kind of be uh, interesting to have the date right in front of them. All right. Uh, on January 9th, or January 10th, uh, will be the first one of the new year, and mm -hmm. it's an old Newstead and photos. Mm -hmm. uh, will they be showing photos there? Yes, Jimmy, Jimmy Stapleton, who uh, is a uh, very good photographer and has mm -hmm. been in the local historian field for some time. Uh, was going to present some photos and slides and some exhibits of the good old days in Newstead, and mm -hmm. we welcome you to bring your photos along to share. Mm -hmm. And another thing which I might point out in that field, uh, if you were able to come and help us identify some of the people in these old photos, it would just... be a great asset to us. Because I was just going to mention that. I was going to say, you probably need somebody to help you identify some of the people in some of yeah. the photos, right? If people would only learn to put the names of the, <laughs> That's right. on the back of the photos they have, and then yeah. it would be easier for the rest of us some other time. Getting into February of next year, uh, right on Valentine's Day, we're going to get into uh, historic buttons. Uh, uh, Richard Gristen has a sh button collection which she will bring, and mm -hmm. we will also entertain anybody else's buttons they want to display. Mm -hmm. uh, you can almost make a little pun on that. Yeah, everybody who comes has all their buttons. Has all right? their buttons with yeah. you. We're just going to say that. But uh, herbs and medicinal plants uh, in March, March. In, will be in March. Uh, Mrs. Stanbury will run, conduct that program. 
I know these are all at 8 p.m. too, aren't they, Jeff? Oh, yeah. We meet, uh, we try to start promptly at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. And again, we meet in the basement of the library okay. on the corner of John and Franklin Streets. Mm -hmm. And I might mention while we're talking about place there, if I may, uh, if somebody has a transportation problem, all they have to do is call uh, uh, Kelsey Webster or Ellsworth Brown, uh, and I'm sure we'll arrange to have somebody pick them up, too, because okay. that sometimes is a problem, especially in the wintertime. All right, let's run through these quickly. April, uh, we're going to visit the Clarence Historical Society's Museum in May, the a wool merchant, where we're going to discuss wool mm -hmm. fabric. Uh, tour of Newstead in June, the 4th of July weekend will be the antique show, crafts and hobby show, a picnic in August at dinner in September, Akron school days in October, and Akron and the wars in November, and back to a Christmas party in December of 1980. And John, I'll tell you, our time is just about all gone by. It was really interesting talking to you this morning here. We'd like to thank... Uh, John Hart, Jr., for being with us here on Lancaster Speaks from the Newstead Historical Society, and uh, we just reviewed the entire 1980 program. So, John, I'd like to wish you uh, good luck in all your programs, and uh, we hope to have you back again real soon. Thank you very much, Alan. This morning, this is Lancaster Speaks, and this is Armin Court. We have been talking to Mr. John Hart, Jr., from the Newstead Historical Society in Akron, New York.